Okay. Hi, folks. Um, and I hope you still have some energy left, all right? Just a very few things about me. I am Evangelia, mostly called Litsa. I'm a UI software engineer at Elastic. Since two years, relocated back to Greece. I've spent the last decade in Zurich in Switzerland, again as a front-end software engineer. And before that, I was in London for a couple of years, working on Semani Web, defining RDF schemas and extending ontologies. All right. Um, why I chose this topic? Um, at the first glance, it might sound like a cliche of state management, okay. Um, but I really believe that state management is a source of many bugs for applications and uh, it can cause uh, low um, performance as well. Um, my goal for today is not to actually do a battle between them, but to make a comparative analysis and like a technical surgery between those guys. Before presenting the different state management libraries that have popping up all the time, and especially around the React ecosystem, let's try to abstract what is happening in the browser, framework agnostic, state library agnostic. I have separated the data flow into two processes, the data fetching phase and the data update phase that we will see on the second graph. So on this graph, let's see how the data flow in the browser, the very first time a web application is loaded. We hit the, the server, Sometimes we have a proxy layer where we cast things for future retrieval, and then we hit this wall. It looks like a CPU. Huh? Um, this is the wall where we read the browser, the data read the browser, but before actually we see the data as pixels on the screen, there are some standard processes that are happening in every web application. I explicitly specify them as following. Data transformation, data bonding, data rendering, and sometimes we have data visualization. Data visualization is when we have various types of graphs. Let's quickly see what is data transformation. Data transformation in every web application is this phase during which we don't blindly um, um, render what we get from the backend. Sometimes we do some modification of the data. This could be because um, we want to camel case the data, spascal case them, slightly change their format, Sometimes we receive a different type for the ID, for example. There have been many times where the ID can be sent as a string from the backend, but we want it to be a number. And because uh, TypeScript doesn't solve problems during compilation time, we need to make sure from our side that we clean up and fix the types. Sometimes, sometimes we need to append some, data, some IDs to do data normalization. For whatever reason, the data transformation is a concrete sub-process when we receive the data on the browser and before we actually show them on the screen. It's nice to remember this as a sub-process so that you remember in your applications where you can place this logic, in the components sometimes, in the models, in the services. And the data binding, which is the core of uh, front-end, don't laugh with my graphs here, they look like comics for a kindergarten, but focus on the content. Uh, data binding is a process uh, during which we map JavaScript values into UI control elements. More precisely, you can see that the different fields from the JSON are mapped directly to UI elements in this declarative way of rendering data. Um, I'm saying declarative, I'm emphasizing the word declarative because in the past decade, the way we were uh, rendering data on the web were based on an imperative way. On the declarative way here, we are telling to the, to the browser what we want to show on the screen. The what is what markup, how the HTML should look like, where is the header, where is the body in it, where the title should be placed. So we define the what. And the last phase is the rendering. This is one of my favorite um, um, diagrams, I steal it from the reference you see there. It's a great article, I recommend you to read it. Data rendering in a few words is the process of converting the instructions we see on the screen into pixels actually. All right, after we have done all these guys and our, our data have been successfully rendered on the screen, sometimes we have data that might take longer to load. So there are three potential uh, outcomes when we load data on the web. Either they fetch properly, successfully, like the list that you see on the right part, either they are still in progress, or they are not fetched at all. We as UI engineers, we, we are responsible of taking into, of implementing this logic as well. There have been often times 
that if we forget to do error handling the user uh, or load, loading state, the user might believe that the application is broken and it keeps loading infinitely. So we need always to remember what are the, all the potential states that can happen in an application. And many of these can happen concurrently. Eh? During data fetching, we have concurrency. We can load multiple uh, uh, data at the same time from multiple HTTP, uh, from multiple endpoints. Uh, once the data are, are in the browser, they can reside in different parts of the browser. Some of them, the most of them that we discussed in our state managers, reside in the in memory JS. Add, uh, others reside in more persistent layers like the cache or the index DB. Um, all right, this is the discrete processes that I want you to be aware of. Let's go to the data update phase. What is happening? when we try to, we as users, the data update phase starts when we as users start interacting with the interface. Let's assume I'm clicking the remove button here. Before I do anything, I'm taking a screenshot, Chuck, in this uh, place. This screenshot that I just took on the screen is what we call the state of the application at this moment in time, because it shows us what is the list of items I'm rendering on the right part, what is the video, what is the video and the URL of the video on the right, uh, left column and so on. What is the context for the statistics uh, component, for example. This is the state of our application. When I start removing this item, I'm expecting, I'm updating, I'm changing the state this moment. How I'm updating the state, we will see later on in different, in different state managers. But for sure, we are changing something. And we are expecting that the change that we made, the removal of the item, we are expecting this to be reflected somehow in our screen. This is the, the reactivity. So let's keep these abstracted notions here. Um, if this component or information of this component, let's say these thumbnails, I have read them on the second screen in a, under a collection. If this component, this thumbnail, is used on the second screen, I'm expecting, I'm predicting that what I did here on this item, I'm predicting, if this was uh, successfully managed from us, I'm predicting that the, the behavior, the, the operation that I applied on the first uh, component when I removed the icon, I'm expecting this to have been removed also from the second page, eh? in case we share them predictability, reactivity, because the second component will react to this update. Similarly, let's uh, refresh the, um, the video from on the left column. When we click refresh, we send an HTTP request. Again, we update the initial screenshot that we took before. We change the URL of this video because probably it loaded a new URL in this theoretical scenario uh, that we're describing now. Uh, and if we start typing also on the search field to filter by items, another operation will happen. Again, during data update phase, we can have concurrency. Multiple operations can happen at the same time. What is this multiple operations? The browser will try to render data on the screen at the same time to perform an HTTP request to load the new info. All these notions need to be considered when we handle our data. And the different state um, management libraries uh, can, um, approach these measures in a different way. Some of them, some state manage management libraries are very good at predictability, while others are very good on concurrency, for example. Um, Oh, okay, yes, uh, username. It's one of the standard information we share across our applications. Besides that, there are other types of generic type of information that we share across pages in our components. Could you imagine what would happen if every time we click on the second page, we render again this information? Or um, could you imagine what will happen uh, if we don't share this information with the thumbnails and every time we go to the second page, we need to load again the list of thumbnails, to re-render again them. So this will uh, result in uh, reduced um, uh, performance. Uh, we can imagine an example where we have a shopping cart uh, and you can imagine different users trying to buy items from the same, uh, from the same uh, e-store. If the state management is not working properly, 
uh, the user will see the wrong pending quantity of the items on the website. So it's really critical so that we really understand how state is handled on the browser. Um, here I'm summarizing again verbally what we saw on the previous screen. What problems do state management libraries solve? They re resolve issues with predictability. We want to make sure that when we apply a change on a part of a screen, that it has a reflection on another part of the screen that is being used. We ensure that we have consistency. We try to improve our performance. We handle concurrency issues better. Um, we, we try to, optim to handle caching issues also very nicely. And there are some libraries that do this smart caching for us, instead of us trying to check every time if the data are stale or not, or if we need to refetch them from the backend. And in general, all this modularization with state libraries helps on the, on the testing. We can test them better. Uh, if I would give a definition in very plain words, what is state management? is how we handle transition from one state to the other. It's this black box that is happening. Um, that's my favorite uh, presentation, uh, my favorite slide, uh, where I've, I've come up with a conceptual framework where I'm listing different mental models uh, according to which the different state libraries have been um, built upon. Um, the numbers, I'm lying to the numbers, that's not the real numbers, but we can make an, uh, a research and see the exact numbers. But let's briefly, uh, and these mental models will help you to bucket the different state libraries that you hear around the web, to bucket them and quickly map them, okay, recoil, atomic, two stand, unidirectional. So my, my goal for today is so that we have a high level architectural understanding from each of them and faster to decide for your projects, your companies. Or I can even mess you up, the opposite result, we will see. So in unidirectional mental models, uh, the data flow towards only one direction. Um, that is only from the store, which is a global JavaScript object that holds all the information for our application, down to the component. All these, again, are state managers, mostly for global state. The front end, uh, the UI guys here know that we have local state and global state. So I take as a prerequisite that you, you are familiar with the difference between the two. All right. Um, atomic, atomic mental models. Um, this, in these guys, the information is stored in smaller chunks, smaller units, which are called atoms, instead of a global whole unique object. And the atoms are um, updatable and subscribable. What does this mean? Every time we change a value on an atom, it's being rendered directly on the component. Um, reactive ones, these are one of my favorite ones. Uh, they are based on, on principles of reactive programming in a nutshell. Um, in reactive programming, uh, an update on a variable ha has a direct impact on another one. There is interdependency. How does this relate with the unidirection also that you understand? In reactive um, state models, um, the flow is, is like bidirectional. When we make a change on the, compon on the component, instantly it is updated on the state and it comes back to it. We will see later on how it, it looks like. But just a, a core difference here. In atomic and in unidirectional, we said that the data are stored in JavaScript objects either in, in one huge one in the first one or in smaller ones. In reactive ones, the storage concept that we use is, is observable, but not JavaScript objects. The observable um, are like streams of data that are emitting values over time. And we will see later on, on the diagram how this looks like. Finite state, finite state is not exactly a mental model, but I found it really interesting. Um, and it feels to me like uh, an old concept that we could use more often in UI, in front end. Finish state is a mathematical model. The mathematicians here know better than me, uh, in which we perceive the, the application from the behavior perspective. An application has a behavior, and we can transit from one behavior to the other via events. This is what's happening in finite states. We will see. Cache and server state, that's a name I gave to this uh, mental model, is the case where uh, it's the React query, it falls under this category. In this mental model, it's similar with unidirectional, meaning the data flow to towards one direction. But instead of flowing from store, which is stored in memory, they flow from the local storage to the components. 
and the local stall is in turn is being updated from the from the back end, of course. The hooks and context, I left it here just for reference, is uh, the built-in uh, React way, how you can uh, avoid props drilling and go down to components, uh, to nested components. Uh, this is uh, a visualization I created for you so that we faster map uh, the, the gazillions of names that exist nowadays for state managers. Uh, right, uh, under unidirectional are the NGRX store from Angular, Vuex, and Redux, the three more popular so far guys that we know for state management. Zustand, it's funny because I speak also German. And so when I saw the word Zustand as a state library, it, it was really funny. Like for us, the Greeks, we say catastasis, JS, something like that. Anyway, um, atomic ones, uh, finite state machines, we will see the X state. Um, Mopex is a reactive one that we will see. So later on the, on the presentation, we will see for each one of them an example. Uh, let's go to the more popular guy so far, which is the, the Redux. Um, I'm going to show you not Redux, but Redux Toolkit, which is the most, rec the most recent recommended approach on how we do state management in Redux. I want you to notice the, the, that the state is like a JavaScript object again. But I split it into smaller slices because in the Redux Toolkit, we don't store them all together in the same store, but in smaller slices of store. That's why I have these extra slices. And the difference between Redux Toolkit and Redux is that in Redux Toolkit, we aggregate in the same, in the same slice both the reducer and the actions for the ones that know Redux already. For the ones that don't know Redux, let's quickly see how it works. We have a counter component, and what we want, we want to increase the value of counter. So we click the increment button, and what is happening? We are dispatching an action. Yet, we haven't done anything. We haven't updated any value. We send from the component to the, to the store an action. And the action is like a contract between the component and the store, where we are telling to the store, hey, I want to do this. Uh, so that this is the action, like I'm going to increment, or sometimes we need to pass payloads, like I'm going to increment by X points, whatever. So it's like what I'm going to do. And actually the reducer is the guy that is actually doing what we're supposed to do. What we want to do? To mutate, to update the state. But in Redux, we don't update directly the state. We make a copy of it and the, redu and the reducer mutates the copied version of the initial. Uh, garbage, garbage collector sometimes will remove the old copy, but we create a new copy, we update the value. What value? The counter becomes two, for example. And then as soon as it's updated, it, it's, it sends back, it notifies back to the components, like, hey, updated this value. And the components are, read, are reading this new value and re-rendering themselves. On purpose, I've used this yellowish mustard-like uh, color uh, on these words um, in order to remind you this initial screenshot from the first page. You remember I made yellow there the notions of update and reactivity. And we see exactly now in, in Redux where the update is happening and when the reactivity. Uh, let's see uh, this. You can see now how this is translates to code. What are the custom hooks that we use? Um, what are the hooks that we use uh, to really read uh, the values from the store or to dispatch the action? Here I created the same example across all state managers. Uh, so I'm using the screenshots, uh, not to have any failures during my presentation today, first time. Uh, cool. So on the left side, quickly, we will see how we create the slice. The slice is this, the part of the object of the store. We give a name to the, to the slice. Um, and I want you to, to pay attention to the very last, uh, to the very last line of code on the, on the left side. You can see const increments counter slice actions. This is, uh, with this destructuring command, we are generating, we are creating the action. As we said before, we need both an action and a reducer. So this is the action. And this is the reducer that actually uh, does the, the actual mutation. On the right side, we see how it's being used in the component. Um, on the, uh, you can see on the bottom part how we, we inject the store in our application. And then on the consumption layer here, 
we have, we have, for example, on the counter uh, component, we read the value how through the user selector hook. The user selector reads, waits to listen from the store when it has updated the counter value. Um, and only when this has changed, it re-renders itself. Uh, when we want to update the counter again, we click on the button and we dispatch. Uh, by the, we need first to, to make use this patch in order to have access to, to the dispatch um, functionality. And we use this patch and we pass the name of the action that we generated on the left side. Let's move on to the um, reactive state managers. And I'm going to use the example of Mobex, how it's working. I want us to, to pay attention on the difference on how the information is stored on the store. We see here not a JavaScript object, but observables. What are observables? Each line here is an observable. An observable is a stream uh, of data. You can see it's a stream of data. And these data that you see here are happening over time, not simultaneously. When we start the application, I cannot hear, okay. We have the yellow, uh, the light blue color is a value. So the first observable, for example, refers to a specific field that we are tracking, like the counter. The second observable could be the temperature or the number of trials. So, so all, the all the different fields, data that we're going to track in our application, we make them as observables. And uh, next to the observables, we have methods, that the, act the actual methods that they actually mutate these observables. So when we start the application, let's say we, ha we have counter value one. It has value one. And I click the button increment. What I'm doing in this case, I'm directly updating the value of the, the light blue value directly is updated and points to the second blue value. How? By using the F1 uh, method, which is for increment. F2 could be decrement. For example, if I had another button, decrement, what would happen? I click the decrement button, it would read the F2 variable, and then it would decrease the value of, um, of that observable tract field. And the moment that we, 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 uh, we mutate the value here, it's instantly being uh, updated in the component because the component, we made it as an observer. That's the prerequisite. We have observable values and observer. It was to listen to, the, to this value. Again, remember how it was at the beginning so that we do the mappings. Where does the re-rendering happen, the reactivity, during which phase the system uh, reacts, and when the actual update is happening in this model. Uh, that's the command that we use. Um, so I'm using human words first to map them to the first graph, and then I'm using the actual code. Let's quickly see the example of, of Mobex. Uh, it's quite simple, very straightforward. Uh, we create the store as a class. Uh, we can make observable many stuff. We chose a class, and we use the makeout observable, which is coming from Mobex, which is the actual guy that is really making these fields as observables. We define the counter trials as observables. And below, you can see the actions that we defined, the F1 and F2 that I saw before. Uh, here, you can see how we are, um, uh, we don't need to initialize anywhere on our uh, app level. When we want to, to use it in a component, we just wrap a component. Uh, we use the observer and we wrap a component under the observer. So that's only needed. And straight, we have access to the store, to the variable of the store. If we want to, to uh, increment, to, to trigger an action, as it, sorry, the first component is to read value from the store. Uh, on the increment button, let's see how the action is done. Again, store.increment. It's as straightforward as this. And as you can infer so far, this is more robust, faster comparable to Redux, because you don't need to dispatch and then the reducer to make a copy and then blah, blah. It's faster. It might have, might be, predict predictability might be less stronger, but still it's quite good enough. I think it has the right balance. The Mobex is it's quite balanced from all metrics. Uh, let's go to the atomic state managers. Um, we said before that the atomic state managers uh, are using uh, smaller units of, the, of where we store the data. These uh, units can be, have usually have the structure of a, a key, uh, which is used as a, a reference to this. It's like the properties that we used to use in, on the standard uh, JavaScript object way. That's the key, we give a name and we give a default value. 
um, from the components, from within the components, we said before that the atoms are updatable and subscribable. That means you can directly set a value in one step. Uh, there is a, a, a hook from uh, recoil, which is called user set recoil state. If you use this hook, it's similar with the use uh, state in React. Uh, where you set the new value, or and you get the value with a get command. These and uh, atoms are not used only for local state; they are used for uh, cross-component communication. Okay, uh, that's the benefit of it. And as the application grows, uh, there is a way to orchestrate the atoms into groups of atoms and so forth. But I want us to be aware that yes, there are units of data that can be stored across components. Uh, for global state. Uh, the, another notion uh, in these atomic state managers, which is important to remember, is the selectors. We have seen also in the other state managers, what are the selectors? They are atoms as well. They have at, mi minimal, small information, but um, their information derives from the atoms. So they, uh, they co further compute some raw values from the atoms in order to compute some more complicated values. You can see that the selectors have, besides the key and the default, also a get property, where we see some exa dummy examples that are used for us here, uh, so that we see how, how a selector can be explicitly defined. And a selector can be also based only on one atom, or like the second selector that we see here, can be based on more than one atom. And in the end of the day, the components level, we can access both of them, depends on the needs on our business logic, either straight to the atom or straight to the component. Um, or, uh, or, uh, <laughs> Greek. Atomic state manager, uh, let's see the, how this looks in code. Um, again, on the left side, I, I write the store. On the right side, we use the implementation at the component level. Uh, you can see here, um, can, I hope you can see my cursor, all right. This, you can see here how we write an atom. Um, you can see here how we write a selector. A selector, um, we give also the name, the, on the variable name, we give the name of atom because in, they are atoms actually, but derived atoms. Um, you can see how we, we can get the products, for example. Uh, here I'm using a custom hook that I will use later on the component level, but you can see here how we can use um, the, 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 the custom hooks from recoil in order to read and set values. Okay, on the right part, on the bottom part, you see how we instantiate the, the, the recoil in our application by, wrapping, by using the wrapper recoil root. And, and let's go to the increment level, to the increment button. We want to increase the counter by one. We use the use recall state uh, hook which is similar with, uh, with standard React. We have a, a getter and a setter. So we use the setter to, to increment it by one. Um, in uh, React, we have just used uh, state, but in recoil, we have three hooks. One explicitly for the setter if we want, one explicit for the value, and the aggregate to one that is being used for both. Uh, depends on the needs. All right. Um, React query. Uh, React query, we mostly think it's uh, fetching a Kashyyyk library. Okay, I'm going to repeat what we see online, but React query is also an async state manager, just to be careful with the definition, which has some nice and smart uh, fetching, caching, synchronization, updating um, logic. Um, what, what it does, actually? Um, I try to summarize the basic type of states that we have on the browser, on the client. We have the client state, which is what we discussed so far, the in-memory JS, which is being lost when we refresh the page. We have the URL router, and we have some more persistent layers on the client, which are the local storage, session, cache API, cookies, IndexedDB. And we have the server state, the data that are coming from the backend. React is really good on on dealing with the data that we get from the backend. Uh, we can classify the type of data that we have in our uh, web application into two types of states. The client, client, client state, I will call them, and client server state. Client, client state is uh, 
have I filtered this item? Have I clicked on this button while the client server state is on the client, all the information that are coming dynamically from the backend. And React Query is very smart on fetching this data, checking when this data gets stale in order to know when to do a, a synchronization, uh, prefetching uh, capabilities very fast. Uh, so these are the reasons why we use React, um, React Query. It simplifies data fetching, provides tools to improve reliability of server data, uh, request retries, that's a nice one. What I want to focus here, although I speak a lot about React related technologies, this is not only in React actually. Nowadays, there is a similar technology, exactly the same for Angular, Svelte, Vue. So initially, it was a React query, the tank stack where it's today, which has been, uh, it exists now for all the popular frameworks. So all these frameworks now are having this uh, caching mechanism, this smart caching mechanism, which is, I think it's really, really cool. Um, we will see one of uh, the basic uh, hook uh, here in React Query, which is the use query on the left side. Uh, this is how we, we actually fetch data. Um, we, we pass a, a, a key because we store the data in the local storage, so we need a key. We fetch the data and we have conditionally, we can fetch conditionally the data based on the third argument. Why I said before that uh, React Query is not a data fetching only library and a, ge a generic uh, state manager. While you can see here that uh, on the second uh, um, argument where we actually fetching the data from the backend, we don't care how we fetch them. If we use Axios, Fetch API uh, or the React tools, the React query uh, commands. We just want the result promise here. So that's why here you could use anything you want. What is the magic is the use query thingy that it's really stories on your local storage and checks for uh, updates and so forth. Um, all right. Uh, you see how we instantiate the query client on the left side and then um, how we, we, we wrap it, we use it um, uh, how we wrap it in application through the query client provider. Uh, oh, I forgot to use, um, in, in, it's okay. In React query, there is also the use mutation uh, hook, which is used when we want to mutate what we have in local storage. Uh, just to be aware that when you mutate something on the local storage, you need, you need also to invalidate this guy in order to react to be smart enough to refetch it from the from the from the backend. Uh, let's go to something different now. State machines. Uh, the state machine, as I said before, is not exactly a mental model, but a mathematical model of computation that describes the behavior of a system that can be only in one state at a time. Let's translate it in front end words. Um, it's a declarative way to model and manage the state of the application. In more plain words, uh, we can define all possible finite states that an application can go through. Because I like graphs and I'm a visual learner, I wanted to better explain it via using these graphs again. Let's go back down to the traditional event-driven UI development so that we understand what exactly is this behavior that I'm describing now. In, in so far, what we have seen, I make a screenshot on the first uh, graph, if you remember, and I told you, hey, this is the state of application. Okay, how, how we, we modify the state so far? We have a screenshot, and then we said, I'm gonna remove this item. We actually mutating the existing state. We just mutate this value. Or maybe we want to refresh the video. We are again appending event handlers to different UI components, but it's the same data structure. It has the same properties. What we change over time is the different event handlers that we keep appending. Uh, but often as our application grows, we will need to write some conditional logic sometimes, like based on the number of items, do this or don't, don't do this. And sometimes we might miss edge cases. It has happened to us. It has happened to all of you. So it's not easy to, to predict all possible scenarios that can happen. While state machines, this will never happen. In state machines, up front, at the configuration level, you define 
all the different possible situations in which your application can be found. And when I say situations or finite state, it's not just a string. Let me, ex let me ex uh, explain. Um, we start the first state and I give it the name of video not started. That's the, the initial state. But this state, we specify also that when we are on video not started state, if I click on the play, it will start playing. Or, or when I click on log out, it will log out. So I specify, I pre-configure for this behavior how the system will act when some events will happen. Because when we go to the second state, which is video, video is playing, when I click on the play button, it will do something different comparable to the first state. So, so that's why we define the second state is called video is playing, and we specify how we can transit from, from one state to the other via events. Uh, again, we are on the video playing, and we click pa pause in this case. We, we, move, we navigate to the video pause uh, state. When we are on the video pause state, Again, we specify this is the video post state, which when I click on this button, something different will happen. Uh, how this translates uh, so a, few, a few core concepts from state machines. Um, what I described right now is a very basic example, a very a basic state machine. In state machine is, is a collection of behaviors uh, and uh, events and how we do the transitions from one behavior to the other. Um, but as the application grows, uh, the application logic uh, grows, so we have some core components of state machines, which are the state charts that are built on top of state machines for more complicated mechanics. So we can combine uh, machines under state charts. And the actor model in its own is an entity that has internally state machines and state charts, so even, 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 even bigger guy. And we can also cross-communicate between actors. Uh, state machine is not tied to programming language and to a framework. It's, it's a concept that we can apply generally, uh, even to a modal. When we open a modal, uh, we can specify, uh, we can start a smaller chunks of our code. Um, it was designed with the local first approach, yes, but with context um, API, we can use it for global states. And there are some also workarounds how we can improve the context API because if we remember that context API is not very good in terms of performance because it re-renders every time the data change. But there are, there are also uh, workarounds for there. And uh, XState is the JavaScript TypeScript implementation um, of init state machines and state charts. It's like user-to-user for local component state and could be used globally as a set in collaboration with context and use query. Uh, what's great in this, in this uh, state machines world, they have a, a visualizer. When you write the machine on the right side, automatically a visualizer, uh, a graph is created, which is really helpful tool for companies so that non-technical people collaborate with technical people. So product managers, developers, uh, designers, we can all talk together. Um, this is on the right part. I, I wrote the example that I described you before as a state, but we will see it on the next screen slightly better. On the left part, uh, you create the machine by using the create machine uh, command from the X state. We specify, we give a name to the machine. Um, let's focus first on the states. A machine can have different states. This, this, these are all the possible states that we can specify for application. These are the different screenshots that I showed before. Uh, we write the states and we specify the transitions that on play event, on play, where I'm gonna transit to which state. Sometimes some states, uh, where they have the invoke, invoke is being executed every time we start at the beginning of a state. All right. Um, and you can directly read it, if you see on the right part, by using the use machine hook that uh, sends you back a state and a send objects, and you can use the send uh, to send messages. To your, yeah. Let me go quickly here. This is a G, chat GPT. Let's trust it. And it's, it's a metrics comparison table. I wanted to see all, all of these metrics in one table at the end. From the perspective of immutability, predictability, concurrency, those concepts that we described on, on the initial graph. So this could act as a quick reference guide to us 
to know how to value for our project. You can see again that immutability in flags, like patterns like Vuex and NGRX Tor and Redux, we enforce this immutability. In Mobex, no, faster reactive, recoil, faster reactive. But you can also do, um, uh, you can avoid immutability also in recoil if you want, yeah. Uh, this is another funny graph that I created which helps from visualization the strength of uh, each one. You can see with green, like it's strong uh, predictability with uh, black color moderate and with red, not predictability at all. And in the, as the last uh, slide, um, I, I tried to abstract some notions that are framework agnostic. And when we try to build a new state manager from scratch, what is something that the future would look like? As I said again, for fetching, casting, and syncing, we have the tankster query, which has uh, uh, libraries for all the frameworks. Uh, it's, it's this smart uh, sub-caching fetching mechanism. So I believe in the future, the state manager will be will contain uh, sub-managers sub and each one will be very good at doing something specifically. Like the caching, it's going to be like a black box in the future for all of them. Async request, we can do uh, RxJS or fetching, like native stuff. And we can be inspired by state machines as a notion to start applying it in our applications. Yeah. Thank you.